Sassy Jack Stitchery is proud to be a sponsor of Fiber Talk. We so appreciate all the wonderful new things we learn, the familiar friends we meet online, and the fabulously talented artists that Gary and team introduce us to each week. Sassy Jack Stitchery is turning five next year. We opened our brick and mortar shop in 2017, and we are ramping up for a fabulous year of celebration in 2022. We'll be sharing more of our birthday plans with you as we work our way through the fall and navigate moving into our new shop home in our beautiful old 1878 Folk Victorian. We plan to be in our new shop home in Whitfin, North Carolina, just a few miles up the same street as our old shop before the year is out. We're hoping to have that beautiful old house decorated for Christmas in late November and time to share our holiday joy and our hope for the new year with all of you. In the meantime, we are rich in linens and threads and charts and notions, all ready to wing their way to your own little stitching nest just in time for cooler weather. You can find us on our website at sassyjackstitchery.com and keep up with us on our social media on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Thank you for your continued support of our shop and of this wonderful gathering place we know as Fiber Talk. Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you are listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week, Heather Gitlin. Heather, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, looking forward to this. Going to have some fun. Learn about. Uh, we're going to learn about master craftsmen, and I'm intensely interested. So that'll be fun. Um, well, it, lots of questions for you there. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. So you're really getting started uh, in the design business. You've been stitching for a long time, but uh, now trying the design thing and and building up uh, to be able to sell and to teach. So what? Where, where are you at in that little? little progression i started designing original work a few years ago Mm -hmm. maybe it's more than a few maybe like four five six years ago and at first it was just for my local chapter to do little chapter projects little monthly projects introductions to new techniques that kind of thing and then um i was working on some stuff and i i go to embroidery camp with my uh one of my guild regions every year and somebody said to me oh that's really wonderful uh you may want to consider publishing it and you know my first thought was really (laughs) (laughs) Um, no one would ever buy it yeah exactly (laughs) but but it it actually i i I ended up uh publishing it in in needle arts it it became a two-part series a few years ago um and then i got really brave and published another one and one of my uh, chapter projects somebody had suggested might make a, a nice free project on one of my guild websites. So that's actually coming out shortly. We're, we're uh, in the editing process now. And then I had uh, designed something else as part of a class, you know, and, and one thing kind of left to, led to another. And before I realized it, I, I had seven or eight original projects <laughs> and I was really enjoying this. And, you know, someday I would like to retire and I would like to retire not to do nothing, but to do something different. And I thought, well, well, wouldn't designing and teaching embroidery make a wonderful retirement gig and maybe a side gig now? And so I've actually uh, started really seriously considering it. My uh, wonderful techie teen has helped me <laughs> uh, in getting a website up. It's 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 not ready to go public yet, but it's getting there. And uh, we're going to do this. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll tell you, that's um, that, there's there's a uh, few better side hustles than embroidery work in retirement. That's uh, that's a good deal. Yeah. 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 Pure happiness. Take me through that mental process of publishing your first design is it is it really kind of i mean there's there's a fear factor there but is is putting yourself (laughs) out what 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 goes through your head when you have to do that oh wow um a lot and simultaneously (laughs) and not always in the same direction so um i had started out my that first publication started out with a, a chapter piece it was just a little 
counted canvas piece. I, I think it was three by three in purples and teals and a lot of string art like stitches, mm -hmm. um, stitches that would be attributed to Gene Hilton. Right got a lot of positive feedback and so then I was asked to teach it at a region meeting and I thought okay but it's it's not enough for two hours that was a big mistake by no. the way but <laughs> <laughs> so I actually ended up creating another piece that coordinated with it and turned them into a little needle book and I taught that and it was really way too much for two hours, but um, got a lot of great feedback and then, you know, decided uh, w when it was looked at as a potential publication, you know, then I had to get serious and learn about really uh, writing stitch directions for people who weren't going to have me in the room, which is is very different from yeah. writing directions for a piece that you're teaching in person. So, you know, I, I, I had to really think about it differently so people could do it um, independently. And we, of course, went through uh, rounds of piloting and people would give feedback. And, you know, sometimes I would think, oh, yeah, I really should do that. And sometimes I would think, huh? Like, <laughs> I don't want to do it that way. And and sometimes you have choices and sometimes you don't. But when you're in the publishing world, especially as a, a new writer, you're dealing with people that have way more experience than you. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. you, know, mm -hmm. you, you have to put your ego aside. And, and, you know, if somebody says, no, don't do it that way, do it this way. Uh, uh, you know, they, they know they've been doing it for 10 years. <laughs> like, okay, let's do it that yep. way. Um, they've dealt with you know? it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a very different process, you know, because when you're writing to teach it yourself, you may still pilot, but you have a lot more control over things. Whereas when you're, you're publishing, you know, you, you kind of forfeit a lot of your independence and, yeah. um, you know, and, and, and for, for a good result, but it's a very different process. Right. Well, yeah. And that's just it is, is you're turning your, your design loose out in the wild and <laughs> you want, you want people yeah. to have a good experience because you want them to buy another design and yeah, so you have to go that extra mile. I'm sure that's a lot of extra work and a lot of sitting back and just mentally going through what you just wrote to make sure it it actually makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, that that's very true. And you have to really take the time to review things and not just review for, you know, punctuation and grammar. Right. You really have to think through the process multiple times um, and maybe think of it from different angles so that you could best serve your, your client essentially, right, you know, right. you're not serving yourself, you're serving your client. Right. Yeah. So w once, once you have one published, is it a, a rush of adrenaline and you're ready to do another one or is it, Oh, that's over. Now I can relax. So what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely a rush of adrenaline. That was really exciting, especially, um, the first piece was a two-part series, so that excitement lasted for a few months. And I, I actually had some ideas in my head for the next piece, but we had some health issues in the family, which postponed things. But then eventually I, I did come up with a second piece, and that would, I have to say like that whole process was so much easier having been through it already, you mm -hmm. know, essentially having been through it twice because of the two-part series. So that was a lot easier uh, the second time around and just knowing what was expected and, you know, what kind of, what different steps would be involved. And that piece, I'm actually already I, thinking of a companion piece for it. And I, I'm, I'm thinking of um, writing that up sometime this year. I don't want to put dates on anything. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Sure, don't do that. You know? yeah. But yeah, the, the more you've done it, the smoother it gets, yeah. definitely. So I can, I, can, I can tell the designer wheels are starting to, to get revved up here. The, the ideas are starting to flow then. Yeah, yeah. It's funny because I think that was one of the things that I was most afraid of. It was like, well, what if I can't think of anything? And I started actually keeping a record of ideas and, and, and this is something I, I'd recommend to other new designers as well um, some people like to keep a journal or, or write with a pencil but I actually uh, just 
you know, have a, a an app on my phone, which is a, a free little project management app. And whenever I think of something, I just put it down. You know, I just mm-hmm. write it down, even if it's very sketchy. And I'll go back to things, you know, like I might be standing somewhere, see a scene and big into sunsets now. <laughs> and I have a <laughs> photograph. I have photographs that I've taken of sunsets and sunrises. And I thought of maybe doing some work with that. I had one of my publications was a moon project. I'd like to do another one of those. And then sometimes just other like bizarre things. Like, for example, uh, last week was Yom Kippur, and I was doing online services with a synagogue, and it was a beautiful synagogue with a lot of stained glass. And I saw some patterns in the stained glass, and I thought, wow, they would really adapt well to yeah. um, to a nice geometric, you know. So whenever I see ideas, I take notes, and that way I, I – I, develop a large pool for later and right now my pool is large enough i need to spend time developing stuff in the pool <laughs> you know? gotta actually use the designs yeah. exactly okay now people are going to want to know what the app is oh <laughs> oh the app i'm using it's called asana a-s-a-n-a all right it, it's there's a free version and an expensive version and I actually use the free version to organize all of my embroidery activity my projects that I'm working on, um, ideas that I have, guild responsibilities. I, I keep it all in there. Okay, so A-S-A-N-A. All right. Mm-hmm. So anybody wants that, it's a free app, Asana. <laughs> yeah. In, in the photos you sent me, a variety of techniques. What uh, what got you started with needlework? What technique? Uh, who, who got you fired up to do this? Oh, wow. that That's kind of funny story because I know a lot of people learn – from their parents and grandparents because their mom or their grandmother had a love of embroidery and passed that down to them. Um, in my case, it was kind of the opposite. I, I grew up in the seventies and, um, my mom was a stay at home mom and it was kind of the in thing at that time to do these embroidery kits. Um, very often cruel kits, you would buy them and, and create them and, pop them in a frame doing expensive framing wasn't a really much of a thing (laughs) at least not where I grew up at that time Um, but my mom would make pillows or pictures and she just really didn't enjoy sewing at all it wasn't her thing and so she would give me her kits and I would she would she would teach me some of the stitches I'd learn others from reading the directions and this was when I was like seven or eight years old and so I learned to stitch from finishing the projects that she didn't want to finish no um and unlike her i became somewhat obsessed with embroidery and (laughs) i was stitching a lot through my teens into my 20s i even remember a friend being embarrassed one time because i i was in line waiting for billy joel concert tickets and i was sewing and (laughs) and they were like really you're not going to do that in front of all these people are you and it's like yeah i'm bored (laughs) (laughs) see i always wonder about that because people like you who have been stitching essentially their entire lives i always wonder about that high school college years early 20s gap that where where it's what's cool and what our peers say and i always wonder if the stitching continued through there if it was hidden in a closet and you're you're doing it right in line at a Billy Joel concert. So, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was not going to put it away. I guess I was never – I was always a little bit of a nonconformist. So, you know, I, I, I didn't need to meet anybody's standards. And I, I did keep stitching really straight through my teens and 20s. And then um, when my second child was an infant, I was looking for some way of – how should we say, spending time with adults. Ah. And I ended up at an embroidery guild meeting. And, and, and so that, you know, of course, made it even worse. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been a pretty constant stitcher. And once in a while, I'll have to put things down for a month or two. You know, sometimes I just feel like I need a break. And, yeah. and that actually happened this past summer. But for the most part, it's been pretty continuous. Yeah, that that point in in the life cycle where I need to have an adult conversation and not for two minutes. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very give me, important. Give me a group of them. I want to talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm still talking to them. So that that 
that child uh, is now 23. <laughs> so, oh, okay. All right. So that worked out. So yeah. I'm still in the same guild and I've joined others as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, I mean, they, you know, we guilds, some, I'm, I'm, I've been a member and I'm not right now a member at large at EGA, but uh, guilds, mm -hmm. I don't think people uh, appreciate the value they have beyond just generating stitching projects. It really oh. is. It really is a way for people to get together, like-minded. You know. Absolutely. Um, you know, I belong to three guilds. One, I, 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 I'm just kind of there to be on the mailing list. But I am very active in the Embroiderers Guild of America, both my local chapter and in the uh, region. And I really enjoy the American Needlepoint Guild too, although I, I don't hold any positions, but I'm, I'm kind of a chronic board member um, at EGA. And, <laughs> you know, you, you meet a, a, a circle of people with a common interest. Uh, you have opportunities to learn new techniques or, or just to improve what you're doing. And, and, you know, it's, it's what you make of it. So you can, take classes or not you can participate in projects or not you know it's it's up to your comfort level um and i've made some really wonderful friends through the guilds you know very long lasting friendships wonderful people um so i i i highly recommend <laughs> guild membership for for you know anybody listening <laughs> yeah and and these days with the uh, with the zoom meetings and the other things it really gives you a chance to to find people all over the place. So it's, yeah. Yeah. It's very accessible now. Um, even post COVID, I, if, if post COVID ever comes, you start to wonder after a while, Yeah. but I, I, I think even post COVID, some of the infrastructure that's already in place to hold zoom meetings, zoom presentations, zoom class, that's not going to go away. You know, it's just that, we'll have both options in the future. Right. Whereas before most stuff you had to be in person for. So either it had to be local or you had to travel. Yeah. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, particularly for EGA, ANG, uh, NAN, that I'm hoping that uh, for, especially their national meetings, that it becomes just part of the mix uh, to, to be able to take classes online during a sem national seminar uh, I really hope that that becomes the norm because it, you know, I just look at all the people who could participate who can't travel to right. ne next year New York, for instance. Um, and just, yeah, a lot of benefit there, I think. Oh, I agree. Yeah, not everybody could afford to travel or has the life circumstances um, or maybe some people want to be in person for some things and, and remote for others. You know, it really has opened up a, a new world, I think, for a lot of people who weren't able to participate in the past. Yeah. Well, my uh, a concern I've had and one that is growing is uh, getting young people into the hobby. And uh, we you know, desperately need to have a concerted effort to involve young people at all levels and give them an opportunity to participate and uh, to learn new techniques and to meet some of the amazing talent that is, is in these, in these groups and online for a lot of them, you know, they got a kid at home. Uh, they got, uh, if they're going to take vacation time, they want to do it with their family. Uh, so online is a chance to involve them and expose them to these things. And, you know, that's cause that's the future. And if we don't uh, take care of it, we're not going to have it. <laughs> uh, oh, absolutely. We, we we need to pass this down. We need to have somebody to pass it down to. And so we need to meet people where they are, whether they're young people or, uh, you know, young parents, students, uh, busy business people. We need to meet them where they are or it's not going to appeal to them and they're not going to be able to maintain the connection. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. So true. Yeah. All right, now I got to know, you're in the middle of the Master Craftsman program, and we did uh, two or three videos when we were at the EGA National Seminar, where they had uh, what people were doing and had done to complete their Master Craftsman. Which which one are you doing, and 
what's the experience like? Oh, wow. It's interesting. So I'm currently working on the uh, Canvas Work Master Craftsman Program. Okay. And I say currently because there may be others in the future, um, but it's a huge <laughs> undertaking. So not promising anything until I survive this one. <laughs> you know? um, so, so the Master Craftsman Program um, at EGA – uh, is what I'm in. And, you know, there are different guilds have programs that are similar, but my experience, what I could describe it is, is pretty much central to EGA. So EGA has a number of different master craftsman programs. I, I think eight or nine of them. It was really hard to pick where to start. And, um, the reason I chose canvas was because I felt that my design strengths lay in canvas I'm also pretty strong and counted, but it's funny. I was kind of tired of counted, so I thought, okay, canvas. And now, of course, I'm tiring out a little bit of canvas. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, the, the way the programs work is that there are six steps that you have to complete. And, and these steps, these are not learning steps. These steps are essentially you demonstrating your ability. So you're given a set of directions and for Canvas, the, the first two steps involved a design, a line drawing they give you, and then certain instructions about how you're going to complete that. Um, stitch guidelines, not, not put the stitch here, put the stitch there, but you know, you're going to select from these stitches, this number of stitches, you're going to use this type of color scheme. Um, and then you're going to explain to us why you did what you did after you produce an exceptional piece of work. You know, um, there are technical requirements. So, so there's, there's enough framework there to keep you from blowing things up, but enough room that you can play and, and, and do a little uh, experimentation then. In those first two steps, yeah. okay. yes. And then from the third through the sixth step, you're either adapting designs or designing your own. So it's much riskier okay. <laughs> once okay. you get further in. Um, so I did, you know, complete the first two. Um, the, 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 the first I, I chose to do a... Um, a, a, a picture of fish, I call it koi, and and um, you know successfully completed that. It actually passed with distinction, as did the next one. And so I thought, oh, I'm on a roll here, right? Everything's uh -oh. going great. <laughs> yeah, you know where this is going. And so the third step, um, you could either do a, an original or an adaptation, and there were certain requirements. You're using particular types of patterns. Um, and I created, um, actually a still life. I, it was the funniest thing. I, I, I bought fake fruit, you know, plastic fruit and I staged it and I had my poor son hold the light in different directions and took 3 million pictures and <laughs> moved the fruits around and eventually settled on the one I wanted to do. And, you know, then I had to get it into a drawing and get it onto the canvas and then adapt it for needlework, which is a lot more complicated than it sounds. Um, and okay, I'm I thinking of your son. Thought... I'm, I'm thinking of your son right now. The next day in school, <laughs> we played video <laughs> games last night. What'd you do? You don't want to know. <laughs> 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 yeah, this, this is this the same son um, who is helping me with the website. His name is Eric, and I have to acknowledge he, he's just been absolutely awesome and patient. <laughs> so he's he's a big help to mom, and my success in in, in part is dependent on him. So I, I really okay. appreciate him. But so you know, I I created this this uh, still life, which I was really really happy with turned in and um guess what it it, it it didn't end up being as easy as the first two so i i got what's called a provisional pass which Ooh. means you pass as long as you fix certain aspects of it so um working on those um and when you have a provisional pass you are also allowed to work on your next step so i'm actually working on the third and fourth step simultaneously and my fourth step um is a cityscape and um i'm 
pretty happy with it so far. It's 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 got a ways to go, but uh, um, and it it also you know had certain patterning requirements, and I had to choose a color scheme and. So it's it's that's going pretty well. I, I'm finding that actually easier than the third step, but I tell you, it was hard to draw. So, you know, I think when you're in the master craftsman program, you know, a, a lot of us who don't have a lot of design experience, we're used to taking other people's designs and focusing solely on technique. Right. But in the master craft craftsman program you really have to think of design and it's it's hard you know i i haven't taken other than art history um you know (laughs) haven't really taken art class you know i was not a college art major or anything so yeah i don't i don't think art history helps you draw anything no 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 (laughs) it doesn't so i did actually once take a community oil painting class i think so i've got my only last lasting oil painting sitting above me <laughs> but you know drawing for stitching is hard and so you know you you draw your race you draw your race and you know after for me like a month of drawing and erasing I'll come up with the design ready to go and and that was actually true also of one of the designs that I uh did I, I think I sent you a picture it's a cruel piece and that was so hard and, and, and just loads of, you know, more erasing than drawing by far. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And in the master craftsman uh, pieces as well, because your technique has to be so perfect, I really do at least as much unstitching as I do stitching because, you know, you put in things and they're not quite right. There's a problem. You take them out. It doesn't work well with the stitch next to it or whatever. So, you know, or you realize you missed something. And, and so, yeah, there's, there you stitch in reverse a lot yeah, yeah. you know yeah that comes up a lot talking to designers <laughs> where uh, people like me i hate if i have to pull something out but to designers it for the most part it just seems like it's just that's part of the deal it, uh, it is. It's, it's the only it's way to yeah, yeah it's the only way to get where you want to so you just tear it out and start over yeah Absolutely. It's part of the process. And um, I'm always grateful if I only have to pull out one part. And the other thing is, what kind of stitch are you pulling out? Because some stitches are actually really easy to take out. You know, it takes moments to take out a few square inches. And then other stitches, it could take hours to take out a few square inches without, you know, damaging the, the, the canvas. So, right. Right. <laughs> you know. yeah. Yeah. No, it's it, it's a it's a mental thing that I think regular stitchers, non-designers probably need to work on is if if you make a mistake and have to tear a bunch out, it's yeah, you're not happy about it, but uh it's part of the process and you just do it and move on, you know. Yeah, you know, it's funny sometimes people will ask me, you know, what could I do to make my work look more professional? And I always tell them two things. First is don't carry your threads. Yeah, <laughs> Just yeah. don't carry your threads behind empty space uh, or even behind a light color. And then the other thing is if it doesn't look right, pull it out and do it all over again. And that's when people usually stick their tongue out at me. But, you know, it's true. Like, you yeah. know, if you want that good look, it's just more work, you know. Yep. Well, yeah, that's just it. And then when, when you look at uh, skilled stitchers, you know, and their stuff is absolutely perfect, and I don't think you want to know how many times they pulled out sections and redid them. And, um, yeah, you know. people will ask me, how long did that take? And oh, then, you know, I have to calculate both the stitching time and the unstitching yeah, time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I hate that question, how long did it take? Uh, it, whatever. I, that, I, didn't, I didn't have the meter running, so just... Yeah, it's yeah. As long as race. you're happy with the end result, it it, it almost doesn't matter no. unless it was on a deadline. That's right. that's the challenge. If it's on a deadline, it's a different story. Yeah, and don't do that kind of stitching. No thanks. <laughs> uh, no thanks. No. So when when it comes to your design work, what uh, is it mainly canvas, kind of canvas that you're focusing on? What uh, what techniques are you using the most as you as you develop your designs? 
So currently, um, definitely focusing a lot more on counting canvas. And I, if there was like a second place runner up, I would say counted thread. But I did design a piece that I really liked, which was in Cruel. And um, it actually took an award at Woodlawn. And a, a few of my pieces have it. That's been really exciting. <laughs> But so yeah, you just so, kind of you, know, you just kind of threw that in there. That's kind of a big <laughs> deal. It is. It, it's. It is. It's. It's very, very motivating. It, it, it's really <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. And and Woodlawn is Woodlawn also. I mean, it's just. It's such an honor to 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 exhibit amongst the incredible talent there. Um, I mean, just beautiful pieces. But I, I think that I I would eventually like to design some surface or cruel as well because. You know, it's it serves a different purpose for me. It serves a different purpose for the stitchers. You know, you have some stitchers that will say only do cruel or only do canvas and don't like surface. You know, I know a lot of times I'm more comfortable if I have a grid. You know, there's being on the grid and off the grid. And, and you know, there are people that feel very strongly one way or another. But I, I, I think that once I've created a few canvas and counted pieces and I have more of a comfort level and hopefully see people uh, taking the classes or, or buying the pieces and in some way giving me feedback that, Hey, this is working. Then I, I, I will probably want to branch off a little bit and, and do some more cool design or social surface work. Mm -hmm. So, so you're, you're, you're one of those who uh, let's try a different technique. Let's see what it can do. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I get bored easily. <laughs> it's like, even now, you know, I'm putting so much effort into the Master Craftsman pieces. And so, you know, like next year, I, I, I want to uh, I, I want to go to part of the EGA seminar next year. And I'm not even looking at any canvas pieces. I'm, I'm just oh. looking at surface techniques because I, I, I need a break. You know, it, yeah. it, it's nice to switch back and forth. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I'm I'm a big fan of that. Uh, some people believe no, stick to it, stick to one technique and get good at it. And I think by doing uh, multiple techniques, you get you you pick up things from all of them and are better overall. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah. I agree with you. I I agree. Although you know, I respect those people that you know have found their favorite and their comfortable comfort level, but you know, not everybody's embroidering because they want to necessarily learn a whole bunch of things. You know, yeah. some people just want to stitch for the pure enjoyment of it, and that's perfectly acceptable. Some people really want to perfect their technique in one area, you know. So it, it just depends on what you want to get out of it. Um, for me, like I said, short attention span, you know, <laughs> need to need to do different stuff to, to keep feeding my interest. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, and that's the beauty of, of this unlike I think a lot of hobbies is there are just so many ways you can go. And like you say, you get bored, go try something else. People say, Oh, I'm just burnt out. What, you know, what should I do? And my answer is always go try a different technique, whether you like it or not, you'll learn something and uh, you might, you know, might have some fun. And uh, these days there's, you know, there's so many free charts and patterns and projects available that you can use your stash and go try something at really zero cost and yeah. if you don't like it eh, pitch it you know go back to your go, go back to cross stitch or go back to embroidery it doesn't matter one of my friends always says not every project has to be finished <laughs> you know the important thing is that you learn from it and that's so true and you could combine techniques too i i recently uh did a piece i i really loved um from another designer it was not original uh but the base was uh canvas work and then it had ribbon embroidery on it and mm. It's really cool. <laughs> you know, it has has a very unique look to it and I just really love that piece. Yeah, I think um, we're, we're I think we're seeing more people dabble in that aspect of mixing techniques and and really coming up I mean, I've seen some interesting things and uh um it just adds a different dimension to what you can do. I mean, uh, within any given technique, there's plenty of variety. But to to bring in that extra thing, you know, ribbon embroidery on a county canvas thing, yeah, why not? Yeah, it gives things a very unique look, and 
and I think it's interesting, you know, so I had taken some, some ribbon embroidery classes in the past and just done some, you know, projects with my guild chapter and stuff. And you know, here was a way to, you know, do it with something else. And, uh, I don't know. It just gives you more variety of pieces, more options, you know, more stitches available yeah. and it gets you off the grid on your canvas. Right. Right. Is it hard? People say it's not particularly hard once you kind of get oriented. It strikes you as fairly easy to execute, at least reasonably well. Are you talking about ribbon yeah, or yeah. canvas? Ribbon. Ribbon. Yeah. There's, yeah, it, it's, very fussy working with ribbons. Okay. Um, you know, they wrinkle, they tear, they have a mind of their own and don't sit exactly the way you want to. And, <laughs> and so I, I think, you know, part of it is learning how to work with the ribbon more effectively. But another part of it is, you know, not being so uptight and, you know, letting the, uh, the material kind of define the outcome as well. You know, the ribbon is going to curve this way and not that way. Well, maybe the flower should be that way. Mm. You know, uh -huh. <laughs> you know? Mm. maybe there's a reason for that. And yeah. and I think uh, uh, like when I, uh, when I do ribbon and when I did this piece, you know, I, I finished it, I put it aside and then I looked back at it a month later and I had a very new appreciation because, you know, you don't remember the agony of, you know, spending 20 minutes trying <laughs> to get something just to be a certain way and failing, Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. but then you appreciate the whole more, you know, you're, you're looking at the, the forest, not the trees after you've set it aside. And that's yeah. probably true of most embroidery. Oh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. That's, I think if that's true about most things is uh, you just get yourself so involved and you need to just step back and, let some hours pass and then come back to it and you might be surprised you did a pretty good job. You just, you know, <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Cause it, it is, it's, it's really important. easy. Uh, I, I do it all the time uh, under a magnifier. You know, that, that particular little one right there <laughs> is, is just not quite the way I'd like it. And it, you know, there's three more like that. And then you turn the magnifier off and sit up and you know, go ahead, show me, you know, show me where they're, <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. The, the the magnifier, so it you know it has its good points and its bad points because yes, you see those little problems, um, but then a lot of times I will after I'm finished with a piece, I'll, I'll do what I call proofreading, and I'll take a magnifier, and I will run over every square inch of that piece looking through the magnifier, and I find errors that way, so I could go in and correct them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know some people don't want to be that picky but for for the master craftsman pieces or for anything being submitted for a class evaluation i feel like that's really necessary yeah yeah oh. is that how does that go in your head as you're doing your master craftsman pieces i mean is is every pull of the thread calculated and slow or do you just stitch like normal and just kind of pay attention to make sure your attention is is pretty consistent uh, <laughs> oh, okay okay there's, so, there's my answer <laughs> yeah yeah you know it really every stitch should be intentional but of course you know especially if you're doing a fairly simple stitch or if you've been doing the same stitch for a while you know it's kind of like you ever you ever drive down the highway and miss your exit because yep. you know you're you're kind of in the groove and 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 that happens very easily too with with the uh, embroidery so I, what happens is you know sometimes i'll kind of zone out and come back to earth and be like Phew, you know <laughs> that worked out okay <laughs> and then other times it'll be like oh no you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> reverse stitching yep. you know because you, you, your tension really does have to be good and you know they're just looking for so many different things. I mean, the tension, the, the perfect placement of the stitches. And then another thing is your threads wearing out. If your threads are wearing out, you know, you need to end that thread before it starts wearing out and start a new thread because that's important. And that's not just important in Master Craftsman. If you're entering an exhibit and you're going to be judged, you don't want to have old, tired threads in your piece. And so I think when you get in that groove, you have to be really careful because, you know, you, 
sometimes what wakes you up out of the groove is that you're near the end of the thread yeah. and you realize that the last 10 stitches are skinnier than all the other stitches before that. Yep. You know? Yeah. Well, and, and I, I mean, I think that even applies to just regular stitching. I, I know last night when I was stitching uh, using silk and uh, I, I was watching a football game and <laughs> I got toward the end of the thread. Now, what are you doing? You should have cut that off four stitches ago because that uh, that's ragged and, and ripped it out. Uh, but, yeah, I, that's something that I think people need to really pay more attention to is when that, especially pearl cotton, that stuff, will that, that'll show. Oh, yeah. You, you let that wear. Um, it's, it loses its sheen, yep. the, the pearl cotton. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And anything twisted, really, it, it's hard, I think. We really need to learn to use shorter threads, and and we don't want to do that, you know, because we don't want to have to start and end so often. We don't want to waste, but I find I waste more with longer lengths because, you know, then I'm just cutting off the last five inches anyway. Right. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you do. Uh, I I tend to waste thread anyway. I don't waste it. I just uh, don't have a lot of hesitation to just stopping and throwing away a four or five inch length uh just because <laughs> i'm not happy with the way it's looking and it's probably probably makes things much more expensive than they need to be but uh i, I just think it's worth paying attention to that stuff and particularly if you have a field of of one stitch in one color uh, that uh, that'll start to show in a hurry and uh yes it will and, yeah you gotta <laughs> yeah. yeah it's worth staying on top of did i see some mixed media work from you? I'm trying to think. Probably not in my design, but no. I have done some mixed media in some of the classes that I've taken through the guilds, and that's definitely coming. Okay. I mean, that that is definitely a direction I want to go in. I, I am really grateful, actually, to Catherine Jordan and Gail Stafford for introducing me to paint in mm. a non-scary way <laughs> and <laughs> you know and, and it's still you know if, when i when i have to paint things i i still get very anxious and i have to you know i have a thing if i'm going to paint i do it on a weekend morning because i don't want to do it after a full day of work i do it on a weekend morning when i'm fresh before i do anything else and usually when nobody else is in the house mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um but I, I i definitely would like to paint some more i would like to make better use of found objects um so uh, there's definitely more exploration in those areas in the future yeah, that was one of the things that uh, stood out for me at the national seminar, the EGA national seminar, was those kinds of things, the, the mixed media, the found items, whatever, that people are, are incorporating into their designs and, and just even if, whether it's their own design or someone else's to to add some enhancement and, and, and a lot of it pretty effective, pretty well done. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's just it's a different way of thinking of things. Um, I'm taking a, a design for embroidery class right now. Um, it's a prerequisite to the teacher certification program through EGA. And there's an opportunity in that class to explore a lot of different media. Mm -hmm. um, and I am almost halfway through the course now. And I'm hoping that as I progress, like I've already used, I've already used some paint, um, <laughs> but, but not yet. Uh, I've used paint for, for some assignments. I've used embroidery for others. I haven't joined them yet in that class, but I'm hoping to do that as time marches on because I, it's a, it's kind of safe way to practice, right? you know? Right. Um, and, and I, I think it'll be a lot of fun and yeah, you could do a lot of different things. And you know, we have this, this chronic problem with embroidery, not being accepted as an art, you know, like yes. where does craft start, stop and art begin? And it seems that in mixed media, you're more likely to be accepted as an art. Uh, and I, I, I think it's sad that we should have to do that. The embroidery should stand on its own. But I do think that if you're doing mixed media, you have a better chance of being accepted in the textile art world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. if that's your goal. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. It's sad that it has to be that way, but uh, I, I guess it does. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's you know been my experience so far, at least in the United States. I mean, I I, I think that the embroidery world is very different in, in other countries. You know, for example, in Asia or in Great Britain. <laughs> you know, if I had it to do over again, I would have uh, gone to college in England where I could have gotten a, a bachelor's degree in embroidery. There we go. You know? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, yeah. Those opportunities exist. Yeah. Once you get across. Yep. So the mm -hmm. teaching thing, you enjoy that? Uh, obviously, I really you, love obviously it. you want to do more because you're getting certified, but. Uh... Yeah. So I'm a former psychology professor. I've long since had a, a career change, but I, I am a former professor and I do love to teach. And I come from a, I come up from a, a, a line of teachers in the family and I can't really see myself being a professor again at this point, <laughs> but I can see myself being an embroidery teacher. And I, you know, I just really love that kind of, uh, hands-on aspect of teaching embroidery um although well it's a little bit different in the in the zoom and virtual world but yeah, but you yeah. know uh so hands-on in quotes maybe but i really do like that and i i like working with people who love the art i like uh you know helping people get inspired and helping them improve themselves yeah Okay, yeah, I I'm with you. I enjoy teaching. I, uh, I used to say I miss it and I do it tomorrow, but no, not anymore. Not in the public schools, actually. No. <laughs> oh, so you're a former teacher yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Oh, I, I, when that bell rings and the doors close, it's you and the kids. There's nothing like it. Nothing like it. It's uh, yeah. Yeah. I bet. It's the best time. It really is. Yep. All right. Now, I've not had a chance to talk to anyone, all the all the interviews, anyone who has done any Jewish design work. So you get to be the person who answers my questions. OK, <laughs> so, so talk to me about that world of Jewish designs. And uh, that I mean, there seems to me to be very specific designs for specific items uh, it's it just intrigues me. Yeah. So this is something I'm just kind of getting started in. So I had designed a, a piece called a tzedakah box and it, it's basically a Jewish charity box. You, um, it's common for a Jewish family to have a little bank box in the home, drop change in it. Some families it's daily, some it's weekly, some it's on special occasions. And, you know, that when it fills up, you, you send it to a charitable organization. And so I developed a design for that. And I'd like to kind of work that into a line and, and, and also, um, develop some others so you know you, you probably notice when when you open up a, a catalog or, or go onto a website you know there'd be like a hanukkah design or something you know yeah maybe yeah one 40 or 50 <laughs> christmas designs a few easter designs and and um and 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 i think that you know there are a lot of religious traditions that uh get neglected because you know the market is smaller it's yeah. just, I mean, that's, that's the reality. So I feel like there's a need. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of can painted canvas designs, mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for Jewish work, especially there's, there's a, a few different designers that have lines of pieces for B'nai Mitzvot, uh, Bar Mitzvah and, and Bat Mitzvah. Um, they, they have bags to hold your, uh, supplies so to speak and those supplies would be a, a prayer shawl which is called a talis and a yarmulke and uh, uh, other uh, other things that you might have uh, that are associated with the rituals but aside from that you know and a whole bunch of painted star of david designs there's not a whole lot else like occasionally i'll i'll come across a designer that maybe has a a few pieces but i feel like there's a hole and so i you know thought that that would be one of the pushes i mean i, I i'd like to start a, a a small side business and i definitely one 
stream would be, you know, the kind of uh, guild quality, technique oriented um, teaching pieces. But then another uh, another stream would be designs, you know, Judaic designs. So, uh, for example, holiday decorations for holidays besides Hanukkah, because we've got a lot of them, <laughs> um, you know, and uh, Hanukkah actually isn't really that important in the scheme of, of uh, Jewish holidays. Yeah, when it, when it comes to holidays, you guys you guys got it knocked. Yeah. You can, oh yeah, you we have a lot. <laughs> I used to uh, years ago when I was in grad school, I used to work for a um, Jewish hospital, and we had so many days off because there were so many Jewish holidays, and that that was kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, but uh, you know, of course, then you're off though, and you know, you end up in temple anyway. So it wasn't like we were playing around. <laughs> But, you know, there, there's definitely a need. Like, we, there are certain ritual items that you use in a house, like um, a challah or a bread covering. We, you know, the, the sadaka box was another one. Something to hold uh, matzah in on Passover or to cover the matzah. You know, there's, there's lots of these little ritual items that I think are so beautiful when handmade. And I do have a, a matzah cover that my, my mom stitched that I use every year. Uh, but I think it's nice to create your own handmade work for these rituals and then, you know, be able to pass them down. Um, so that's definitely something I'd like to get into. Probably thinking mostly counted work, at least to start with. And I also would like to design a Jewish sampler with the Hebrew alphabet. Mm. Um Mm. And that will be a piece of work. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. That, that that will involve a, um, you know, I'm sh- I'm sure some research. But um, I, I that's something that's in in, in my list of uh, ideas in yeah. my little app. <laughs> in your <laughs> you app, know? yes. Well, that's the the thing about uh, the Jewish designs I've seen is they all seem to be in a a fairly narrow uh, channel of creativity. Is that because so many of them are just a, a one-off thing, token thing, and, uh, or, and there, there has to be a, a broader creativity opportunity there? Yeah, I think I think you're right. You know, I have I, I'm thinking of, of of what I have here. You know, there was this little uh, set of uh, Mill Hill ornaments that I have. You know, there's a menorah and there's a dove and a star and. And I think that my fourth one is a snowflake, which is just generic anyway. Um, and I've seen, you know, some some counted cross stitch designs. There was a company years ago that had a bit more variety. But I think, you know, what a lot of time companies are trying to do is, you know, they want to have something. Yeah. For for Jews there, so um, but you know if they're only going to have one or two things, then they need something that appeals to all levels of ability too Mm -hmm. right so it's going to be more simple so you won't have as much uh creativity i mean i don't think i've ever seen a jewish design that wasn't either a cruel cross stitch or a painted canvas (laughs) and you know how nice would it be say to to have something on linen with a variety of specialty stitches you know where you could use skills right where it's, it's not just about the content but it's also about skills, right? You know. Well, see, that's where it, that's where it is for me. That's where, uh, yeah, my mind goes because even just the alphabet, the letters have such unique shapes. That, <laughs> but you know, and I think create if there was some creativity there, that you could really do some some neat things with those. Uh, you know, not on unlike some of the old English, uh, you know, letters. And it just seems to me that there's there's an opportunity there to really, really go beyond just what seems to me very rigidly designed pieces. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I and mean, there's the the written Hebrew language is just beautiful. The calligraphy is beautiful. Yeah. So so that alone, there's lots of places to go with fonts, you know. And then of course, you know, there's there's just so many holes where nothing's ever been done in particular areas. So I, I, I think there's, there's definitely an opportunity there. I, I think there's a need and, and, you know, I'm hoping that that would be uh, appreciated and, 
I guess we know something is appreciated if it's purchased, right? Right. Yeah, that's, that's a good <laughs> so bellwether. So we'll see. Yeah. It's an experiment, right? Yeah. Life is an experiment. Well, and see, and I, yeah. for me, why wouldn't that kind of stuff be appealing outside of the uh, the Jewish religion, the Jewish community? I would think uh, creatively done, others would be interested too, because it, you know Hebrew is just another language. So why not? I don't know. It depends. I mean, I think, you know, when you think of, you know, what your typical, typical American stitcher is buying, you know, they're not buying stuff written in French or Spanish or Italian either. They're buying stuff written in English. So I I don't know if that would appeal, Um, but there's a possibility. And then, you know, there was also uh, this idea I, I told you about, you know, how I was looking at the the stained glass and thinking, you know, that would very well apply to uh, some geometrics. Mm -hmm. And some of that stuff, even though it has origins in a synagogue, there's nothing that necessarily tie. They're just geometric patterns, you know? I mean, some of them do have like a star of David, but most of them are just geometric patterns and that would appeal to anybody. I mean, I've, you know, seen some wonderful tile work that people have, have turned into geometric patterns and and you know it it sort of moves beyond the origins to you know it it appeals to me now the the color the shape yeah how it was designed appeals to me and the origins are interesting to me but that's not limiting me from stitching it or not stitching it because the the content itself is more generic right right yeah and i guess that's what i was getting to is is there's just opportunity here that to to use those the shapes the hebrew letters whatever it might be uh as art art forms like anything else and why not Mm -hmm. yeah 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 absolutely you know it's it's just it's unexplored territory or at least it's unexplored or or inadequately explored in in embroidery i mean certainly um in other media you know there's a a, a rich tradition (laughs) but right but in embroidery it's much more limited yeah, I don't understand why, but yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> we'll not yeah. solve that today, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, we will not no, solve that not. problem today. No. <laughs> no. no. But at least it gets people thinking about it. Right, you know? right. So what's on the horizon for you de- uh, design-wise, finishing the craftsman thing? Um, what's next? What's next? So, yeah, the the – the first priority is certainly the due dates for my master craftsman pieces. <laughs> I'm mm-hmm. running a little bit behind right now. So, you know, that needs to be my first priority, but I, I do have a shell of a website uh, up and I'm hoping to at least have a few pieces for, uh, for sale and one or two classes within the next year or so. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm thinking 2022, I just feel like it's time. And, and I've been advised with some of the teachers that I've worked with at EGA that this would be a really good time for me to start wetting my feet, you know, piloting a class or two and getting that experience you know so since i i am planning to do the teacher certification yeah um so i i'd like to heed their advice you know but the other thing is you know realistically speaking i have a day job you know i i heard one of your uh podcasts from i think a couple of weeks ago and the the artist you were interviewing said art is not a day job and I just laughed and I appreciated that so much because, you know, I do have a day job and that has to, you know, pay my bills. So so this is going to be a slow undertaking, um, but it's a very exciting one, too. So, yeah. yeah, that would be my next thing would be to to get a few pieces ready for teaching and for sale. Um, and I do have, you know, I had a published a moon project in in needle arts last year 2020 and i i'm I'm starting to think about the follow-up to that as well so 
so yeah, I told you a short attention span, right? So here I am in a few different directions <laughs> already. And, um, you know, the other thing is I'm working on this design class and I'm nearly halfway through. I'm, I'm, I'm behind. I'm, I'm a few months behind and I really want to catch up on that. And I have just loved that class so far. It, I've learned so many new things and it's taught me to just look at embroidery and art in general in a very different way. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really enjoying that. And as I go along in that class, you know, some of the pieces that I'm creating for assignments for the class, those may end up developing into uh, pieces that I would teach in the future. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ultimately we're going to be able to buy thing, buy your designs in the store. Is that uh, also on the, hmm, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Um, I mean, right now my plan is, you know, eventually teaching for, uh, the guilds EGA and probably ANG as well, maybe others and selling through my website, and probably, I and mean, I still have to think this out, but probably in the beginning through PDF download, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, I live in a townhouse. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, how much storage space do I have? I mean, right. it's, it, it's like I look around, it seems like loads, but I know that like, you know, once I get started actually piling things up, that could change. So in the beginning, I'd like to start with uh, PDF downloads. Um, and I am not sure, I guess... I guess whether or not I went into stores would depend on, um, you know, how popular my pieces were. Um, so I, I, I don't think I want to say yes or no yet. Just kind of see how, how that unfolds. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Only one way to find out. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, Heather, I, I, this has been fun. Thank you. Thank um, you. I have thoroughly enjoyed talking to you and, um, you know, Maybe maybe we'll catch up again after the master craftsman. Well, I think we have to. I think we have to. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but I, I I would like to say um, I really do encourage people to get involved in the guilds, and for those people who are already in the guilds, I, I I think it's really worth trying a master craftsman program. There are a bunch of them to appeal to. You know, whatever it is you like to do, and you know it's it's all about self-improvement. Um, and, uh, I can't say it's always been fun, you know, um, <laughs> like I said, stitching, unstitching, there's joys and frustrations, yep. but I think it's a really worthy way to spend some of your stitching time. And rewarding in the end. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe so. Yes. All right, Heather. Thanks. Enjoyed it. Thanks to everybody for listening. <laughs>